So last summit, um, I demoed the Bellman Sparkle engine, and I demonstrated how we scaled our knowledge graph, our biological knowledge graph at GSK to one trillion connections through Apache Spark and the Bellman Sparkle engine, which is an open source project we built uh, internally uh, with the help of 47 degrees and internal teams at GSK. This summit, we're presenting some exciting new features um, in the Bellman engine, logical inferencing, um, being the main feature that I'd like to demonstrate today. So there's one takeaway uh, from this talk. It is this. There is no such thing as a fish. I know, it's tough. We'll get through it. Um, I'll explain in a moment. Here's our agenda. What is logical inferencing through the subclass of entailment? We'll discuss why inferencing is important. We'll discuss some logical inferencing algorithms. Then we'll talk about the equivalent class entailment in drug research. And then we'll hop over to a Databricks notebook and we will demonstrate the Bellman Sparkle engine and inferencing in action. If there's time, we'll have a Q&A. If we don't have time, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Please stop me um, any time during the conference. Happy to answer any questions. So what is logical inferencing? So a knowledge graph has two parts, the schema and the instances or the data. The schema are your entities and your connections in your domain model. So in this really simple domain model here, we've got class of fish, class of tetrapod, human, rabbit, lungfish, goldfish, and these are all connected with subclass of connections. This is our domain model. Next, we have the instances for the assertional knowledge of our domain. So you can think of this as the tables in your RDBMS. Um, so essentially we have instances of our entities and connections. So here we've got a goldfish named Bubbles, we've got a lungfish named Slippy, we've got a human named Alice, and we've got a rabbit named Bob. Very small database. So without logical inferencing, our Sparkle query engine works like a SQL engine and a RDBMS. We issue the, let's say a scientist issues the query, please give me all instances of tetrapods in the knowledge graph. The engine takes that query, transforms it into Spark operations, we scan the table, we see that there are no concrete instances of tetrapods in the knowledge graph, and we return the empty set for the reason, very reason that we're not using logical inferencing and there are no concrete instances of that class. So when we query with logical inferencing, a scientist issues the query, please give me all instances of tetrapods in the knowledge graph. Our query engine parses the schema, looks for connections that are relevant to the query plus the data, and then scans through the table with this knowledge and returns the results, Alice and Bob. Alice is of type human, Bob is of type rabbit, both are subclasses of tetrapods, therefore they are tetrapods, which is why we get results. So why is logical inferencing important? So we've got this toy schema that we've been querying for years and everyone's happy and scientists are querying and getting back the results they expect. Suddenly, science comes around and says, hey, there's no such thing as a fish. Colloquially, yes, there's such thing as a fish. Scientifically, it's more complicated. Fish inherit from different common ancestors. So there's no common ancestor fish that other fish inherit from. So science says, hey, fish are being split into these two classes called Dipnotetropodomorpha and Actinoterygy. So now we have two classes and all fish inherit from those two classes. So while the rest of the world scrambles to change their data and transform their data to work with these new classes, we're not worried because we're using a knowledge graph with a schema and logical inferencing all we need to do is change one line in our schema. And now when we query for, give me all instances of dipno tetrapodomorpha in the knowledge graph, 
Our query engine again parses the new schema, traverses the graph, finds the relevant connections, then scans the knowledge graph, finds all the instances, and returns to you Alice, Bob, and Slippy. So if you've noticed, uh, the version of subclass of that we're using here is transitive. So what that means is we recursively traverse the tree from root to leaves until we reach those leaf nodes and then return back all of those instances because a human is a dipnotedral protomorpha and so is a lungfish. Um, so, whoops. So one, one aspect that I'd like to really reinforce here is that we didn't change our data. All we did was change our schema and that affected the results that we get back. And that's really powerful. So what does logical inferencing look like in code and how did we implement it in the Bellman engine? There are two algorithms in logical inferencing. There's the forward chaining algorithm and there's the backward chaining algorithm. Here's our query, give me all tetrapods in the knowledge graph. This is a Sparkle query. Here are our instances and our schema. Remember the entire knowledge graph is the data plus the schema. Um, we take both of those into account and that's the knowledge graph. The RDFS um, standard provides a few different entailments, subclass of being one, domain being one, range being one. Here is the subclass of entailment. These entailments are set up as if-then statements, and the if-then statements have rules attached to them. That's why sometimes an inferencing engine is called a rules engine, um, because we have these rules that we follow in order to um, affirm uh, our then statement. So in forward chaining, we start from the left and work our way to the right. So we replace the variables in these, um, in these rules. So if human is of subclass tetrapod and Alice is of type human, then Alice is of type tetrapod. We call it forward chaining because we move forward through the chain of if-then statements to reach our goal. And then under the hood in the Bellman engine, what we do is we generate this query. So we take the left-hand side of the entailment, we place that into a where clause, and then the construct statement is where the magic happens. We take the right side of the entailment, we put that into the construct statement. In the Sparkle query language, construct uh, is a very powerful feature. It returns to you a new subgraph that you can materialize new data from and return it to the user. In this case, we're not returning it to the user. We're kind of doing this under the hood. We're generating all these new connections that didn't exist before. And then return to the engine um, this new knowledge graph with these newly inferred connections uh, that in, uh, indicated by these dotted lines here as uh, 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 Alice is of type tetrapod and Bob is of type tetrapod. We then run the original query on this new knowledge graph and get back the results we expect. The next algorithm is backward chaining. Same query, we've got the same data and instances and schema. We've got the same subclass of entailment with the same rules. With backward chaining, we work backward. We start with the goal and work our way to the left. So we fill in what we can in our then statement. We work our way from right to left, and then we substitute what we can in the left side of the statement. That's why it's called backward chaining. We're going in the reverse direction. In our implementation, it's a little bit different than what we do in forward chaining, where in forward chaining, we're generating a new knowledge graph with these new connections. In backward chaining, we're rewriting the query. So we take the left side of the entailment, we put that into the where clause, we take the right side of the entailment, we put that into the union clause, and then we run that query on the data and get back the newly inferred data. There are different performance characteristics for forward and backward chaining, which is why for every entailment in the RDFS schema, uh, RDFS uh, specification, we've implemented forward and backward chaining so that we can tweak our queries um, so they can run as quickly as possible. There's a lot more detail around these techniques in the book, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach by Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig of Berkeley.
So what does all this have to do with drug and vaccine research? So imagine that you are a data modeler in the research group of a large pharmaceutical company. And it's your job to integrate all of the company's research data together into a knowledge graph. So like any good data modeler, the first thing you do is start setting some standards. So first thing you do is you set a standard for the gene class. And you plant the flag in the ground and you say, going forward, we're gonna be using this gene class to classify all new discoveries, all new information about genes. Um, it's gonna be great, everyone will follow this standard and will all speak the same language. So you bring this to your manager, manager says, great, love it, please socialize it around the company. So you talk to your colleagues in human genetics and they say, huh, we use the bio-ontology gene class to classify our genes and we've been doing it this way for 20 years. So we can't switch to this new canonical gene class because it'll disrupt our research. You're welcome to our data. You're welcome to transform it and use it and have it conform to this canonical gene class, but it'll be your responsibility to integrate it into your knowledge graph. Um, we can't change the way we work. So you say, okay, you take that information and you go to the next group. This time it's a research group at an external university that the company works with. And they say, oh, we use the bioontology gene class to classify our genes. So the problem here is that when you query for all instances of genes and variants and their variants in the knowledge graph, you're only getting back the canonical gene class in your query. And by extension, when you look at the entire knowledge graph, you've now got these islands inside your knowledge graph that you can't traverse to. So you're only getting part of the data. You're not taking, you can't take advantage of all the rich data within your knowledge graph. Well, there's an entailment for this. This time the equivalent class entailment in the web ontology language. So equivalent class does exactly what it says on the box. You can tag two different classes, two or more classes as equivalent and when you query for one, you get all of them back. So when a scientist queries for all genes and their variants in the knowledge graph, you get back all the genes. And by extension, you've now bridged these islands in your graph and you can traverse the whole thing. So if you were to search for the gene TP53, you'll get back the data in all of these different groups data um, and then you can take this data, deliver it to your AI ML team who uses that data to perform drug discovery. Um, and as we know, neural networks like more data. So let's hop over to our Databricks notebook and demonstrate what we can do with logical inferencing. So I've got my cluster up and running here, uh, photon enabled, we're at Databricks Data and AI Summit, why not? Um, if you haven't heard of Photon, you probably will before the end of the day, um, but we've got it turned on and we are running on Spark uh, 3.1, I believe, and Scala 2.12. Okay, so let's get started. Um, by the way, I've run these queries before this talk. Some of them take minutes to run. I'd rather not bore you sitting here looking at progress bars. So um, let's, start, let's start simply. Let's take our instances that we've seen before. Uh, we set up a data frame. Uh, and then we've got our schema. We set that up as a data frame as well. So we've got these um, different, uh, we've got this list of um, entities and connections specified here. We've got our query. I can bump the size of this up a little bit. We've got our Sparkle query here. 
give me all instances of tetrapods. And then we can execute the query for all tetrapods without logical inferencing. So the Bellman engine adds this nice little convenience method to, the, to your data frame. It's this Sparkle method. You pass it a SQL uh, Sparkle query, and you get back uh, your results. So when we execute the query, we get no results because we're not using logical inferencing. We're just scanning the instances of the data. So now let's execute the query with logical inferencing. So our interface for using logical inferencing, admittedly, it's a little complex because of the amount of uh, configuration. We're working on a much, much more user-friendly interface. So we compile the query. Uh, we set up our configuration mode. We set inference mode to forward chaining because that's what we want to use. We set, set our inference entailments, in this case, RDFS9, which is the subclass of entailment. And we run our query. And we get back the results we're expecting. So let's try that again. And this time we'll query all instances of fish. Here's our query, our Sparkle query. First, we'll do it without inferencing. Again, just to reinforce that without inferencing, uh, we get nothing back. Query return no results. Let's execute it with logical inferencing. Here's our compile uh, method again, setting inference mode to forward chaining. And then we can execute our query. And again, we get back the results we expect. Now, that was the non-transitive version of subclass of. We also have a transitive version of subclass of where if you, if you query for fish, you get everything back that descends from fish. And you can see that in our inference entailments, RDFS 9, which is we need to include as a dependency, and then RDFS 11, which is transitive subclass of. And then when we execute that query, we get back everything in the graph. And what's really nice about this is that we get back not only the explicit class of the instance, we also get the inferred class as well. So Alice is a human, and she's also a tetrapod, and a fish apparently as well. So science comes along and says, well, no longer such thing as a fish. So we're gonna change our schema to eliminate fish as a class. We've got these two classes, Dipnotetropodomorpha, Actinoterogy. All we do is we update our schema. So this is our new species schema with our new classes. We're not touching our data. Here's our query for the new class. And then we can execute our query using the RDFS 11 transitive subclass of version. When we execute our query, we get back everything that is a dipnotetropodomorpha. One of the really important things to note here is that when you don't have logical inferencing, you need teams of data engineers to manually forward chain your data. Um, we've, we did this last year and the year before when we didn't have these capabilities. So we had a team of data engineers actually materializing these connections and saving them in our knowledge graph. So there's two reasons why that is inefficient. The first is pretty obvious, it generates more data. The second is that it just costs more, you need you need people to transform the data. And then actually there's a third reason why it's inefficient is because now your end users need to know about these new classes and all of the subclasses. So if you're looking for a transitive relationship between a root and a leaf that's maybe five or six hops, your end users need to know what all those hops are and include that in the query. But because we are mechanizing this process, 
the user doesn't need to have all of that knowledge. All of that is kind of hidden from the user and they get back what they're expecting. So let's talk about the equivalent class entailment a bit. So here's our familiar graph. We set up our schema, super simple, which is associating the second gene class with the first gene class and associated the third gene class with the first gene class. We set up our data frame. This time, we set up a few instances of genes. So TP53 is of type first gene. TNF is of type second gene, meaning from another data set. EGFR is another gene from a third gene class. And then we've got our extended connection. So we know of a variant called 123. That is a gene variant of TP53. And then variant 456 for TNF, variant 789 for EGFR. So here's our instances. Set those up. So this is essentially our data. So let's set up the query for retrieving all instances of gene classes. Here's our query. So what we're doing in this query is we are querying by the first gene class, which is essentially equivalent to second and third gene class because of our schema. And then optionally give me back all the gene variants that we find in the knowledge graph. So we compile that query with Bellman. We include the equivalent class entailment. Um, so we've got our instances, we've got our schema, we've got our query, inference mode set to forward chaining, and we've got OWL CAX EQC1, which is the technical <laughs> or uh, you know, code for um, equivalent class. Then we execute the query. And we get back what we expect. We get back uh, all the different genes because they're connected by equivalent class. So let's go bigger. Um, we've been playing with these toy data sets. Let's, uh, let's query 4 billion triples. So I, like I said, I've pre-set up these, um, uh, these queries. I've cached some of our, knowledge, uh, some of our larger knowledge graphs. Um, so here's our first gene class. So we're gonna do this without inferencing. Inferencing mode set to none. When we execute our query, we can see that we are only getting back type first gene class because logical inferencing is turned off. We've got a mixture of first, second, and third gene classes in our knowledge graph. And when we do a count on that, we get back, let's give this a moment. we get back 1.3 billion results. So essentially this is what we've done. We've queried only a part of the knowledge graph and have left out quite a bit of data there. So that's all that rich data we're missing out on. So let's compile the query, this time including equivalent class. So we've got all gene class. We've got our genes knowledge graph, same as before. We've got inference mode set to backward chaining. In this case, we're setting inference mode to backward chaining because we're working with so much data here and we're generating so much data that backward chaining just works better. It's better just to rewrite the query and issue that on the knowledge graph. Um, backward chaining is actually much more difficult to implement than forward chaining. Forward chaining is super simple. It's just replacing if-then statements um, and generating that, that new knowledge graph and then issuing your query on that new knowledge graph. Backward chaining um, is a lot more performant in many cases. We found backward chaining to be a lot more performant in most cases, especially with big data. So essentially, this is what we'll be doing. 
querying the entire knowledge graph, we've bridged these gene classes together. We're getting back all that rich data within our knowledge graph that other teams have discovered that other teams might not know of. So when we run that query, Like I said, these queries take longer when they're not cached. Um, and we get back 3.9 billion, close to 4 billion. And then let's display what's contained in the graph in our results. This query, unfortunately, can't be cached because we've got a random in there. And we can see that we've got a mixture of first, second, and third gene classes in there. That means our logical inferencing is working and doing what it should be. So that's the end of our demo. Here is the link to our Bellman engine on GitHub. I believe the slides will be available after the talk. Um, but I'll leave this up there for a few seconds uh, so you can grab that QR code if you'd like. I'll also have it on the last slide if you miss it. And here's last year's talk. Last year we talked a little more about um, the Sparkle engine itself and the foundation of how it works. So um, essentially the way Bellman uh, works uh, at a fundamental level is it takes a Sparkle query we parse that Sparkle query, um, turn it into uh, Scala objects, and then we traverse that hierarchy of Scala objects, convert those into uh, Spark data frame operations, and then execute the query. Um, so every time there's a hop in our graph, that's a join. Um, so pretty interesting. Um, and it'll give you, if you watch last year's talk, you'll get a lot more context around um, how Bellman works. Thank you very much for joining the session. Thank you, Databricks, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Uh, great talk. So you already mentioned uh, for uh, backward chaining performs better, but I have a question about forward chaining because when you compute all those inferences and schema changes, all those inferences need to be updated. So are those inferences like temporary? How do you handle updates in that case? Yeah, love that question. The connections are transient. They exist only for the duration of the query. So after the query is done, they just get thrown away. Um, we are working on some caching so that we could cache that data frame, um, save it to disk so that we don't have to keep generating those over and over again. For very popular queries, um, that is really gonna boost our performance. As we start getting more and more users uh, internally uh, for our platform, it's something we're definitely looking into and that would absolutely boost performance. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question if there is any. Thank you, and thank you for your talk. So I asked a mandatory question. Do you have plans to put it on Python? <laughs> so this works with Python. Okay. So because the source is Scala, but you can include it into any Spark cluster so, that's running PySpark and query. We've done this already. So we've so integrated it with a Jupyter notebook. So. Um, end users, all they need to do is import the library, and then they can just query in the same way using Python. So you get back your uh, data, you get your data frame in Python, PySpark, and then you just execute the Sparkle method on it or the compile method, and then um, you're off to the races. 
Thank you. And the other question in terms of like performance, do you have any comments comparing this with, let's say, if you put the data in some, you know, uh, graph databases? Yeah. So this is, we designed the system as high throughput, high latency. So the use case is AI and ML. So we need high throughput um, egress. So if we're, we're usually not doing point queries, we're usually not querying for one gene, we're usually querying for like all genes or everything we know about a gene, which could be a huge volume of data. So we've accepted that, yep, we take the performance hit on you know, throughput and latency, and then we, um, we essentially use that data to train machine learning models. So a few minutes or even a few hours of compute time is fine. Uh, when we want to load the data, when we want to do fast queries, we either cache the data and have that just as a persistent cluster with the, the knowledge graph in memory, or we load it to a um, downstream graph database like Apache, Jenna, or Neo4j or something like that uh, to run faster queries. Thank you.